Hey family, I am Mark. I'm the host of the Kinship Collective and we are ending otherness. We want to build solidarity by celebrating our unique stories and reimagining scripture together. I have to use my Hollywood voice because today we have with us Oscars 2020 performer, tiny desk performer, singer, songwriter, arranger, uh, multimedia uh, uh, influencer, beautiful voice haver, soul lifter, Aston Turrentine. Aston. I am screaming. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> I, I would give you my fake crowd voice, but uh, the way that the uh, the Zoom is set up, it goes two seconds and just cuts it out. It thinks it's background noise. Mm -mm -mm. No, no worries. That was good. Aston, come on. Aston and I met several years ago doing ministry in the city that I live in that she grew up in. And I was kind of exposed to her heart and a willingness to serve others, but a passion and a gift for music. And so Aston, would you share a little bit about where music comes from for you or your journey to like experiencing music? And if you're like, if there's other things about you that I didn't say that like are important to you? I'm sure whatever you didn't say will come out as I start talking about stuff. But um, I grew up in a super musical family. My mom, she sings and um, was a music teacher when I was growing up. So kind of already had that going on. My sister sings. My brother plays drums and he produces. My dad doesn't sing, but he's a pastor. So it all worked together. We you know, we're singing for the church or whatever. Um, I grew up doing a lot of like musical theater too. That was, I enjoyed doing that, but I, music was not really my thing. I was trying to leave that to my siblings. Mm. Um, I didn't really start getting into it for real, for real till I was studying it in college. So it, it took me a while to love music. It was just it was always the thing that was there and like I knew that I could do, but I didn't really love it or feel passionate about it until I was probably like 19 or 20. Was, was it a, uh, was it an experience that woke up the passion or how did, how did, how did you become passionate about this gift that was always there? Um, you know, all right. So here's the story. Here's how it goes. <laughs> I went to um, APU as you know, but I started out as a psychology major and that was something I was seriously like very interested in um, being a therapist, like a marriage and family therapist. Um, and actually, if I went back to school today, I would definitely go back for something involving psychology because it's still super interesting to me and I love talking to people for the most part. Um, but anyway, I went there for that and I was like having a weird experience, just like not being super interested in my classes, even though I was so excited about psychology. Um, and I had like gone back and forth on whether or not I wanted to do anything musical in college. And I just decided that I didn't want to, um, mainly because of like job security is not really a thing in the music mm -hmm. world, like mm -hmm. unless you're a teacher, which is, I'm not good at teaching things. So I was like, that's not for me. <laughs> but um, I remember one night I was having like a really hard time sleeping. This was my freshman year. Now, if we know anything about me, it's that I sleep comes very easily for me. <laughs> I knock out in like two seconds and I'm like out, out for the night. Mm. Um, I was having a really hard time sleeping. So I took my guitar and I went to the room like a few doors down that was like a common area. And I started writing a song um, and it didn't dawn on me until I had finished it that the song was like speaking directly to all of my fears about like studying or pursuing music. I don't even remember how the song goes really, but um, I know that the premise was like, if God did like X, Y, and Z that we know and we've seen, like I've seen in my own life, why would I worry about something as small as being taken care of when I've been taken care of this whole time. Like, just do, do what God is telling you to do, which mm -hmm. was music. Um, mm -hmm. So 
reluctantly, I changed my major. And um, I think once I started to understand music more and like literally, like technically, I think I fell in love with that. And that's what created the passion for me mm. that is around. So talk to me about like music for music for dummies with Ashton. What are what? So when you're like taking these classes, what are you waking up to? Because you I, I've watched you sing and lead worship and lead music and spiritually when you were in high school right um and so that gift was always there talk to me about how you wake up to the complexities of music and how that changed things for you like what was it about that process and what were you actually even seeing that was like drawing you deeper in that's a good question i think in high school it was something i was doing because i like there was not much well i did a lot of things in high school i was like extracurricular activity queen but um i think i stopped doing like choir stuff and so leading worship was like the only other kind of musical option i had because i didn't want to like throw it all away i still liked it and i knew that i was like good at it but i didn't love it yet um i think towards the end of high school is when i started writing and i think that's what really started the whole like passionate moment. So I started writing songs and then when I got to college and was able to like dissect them and actually know what I was talking about. Cause like when I write still to this day, like it's more feelings based than like theory or like, I want to do this because I know it'll sound cool. It's like, what feels the best to me? Like does the music match what I'm like saying in the words, but going to school and being able to actually like dissect it um, for what it is like at musical face value. That's what I think made me feel more passionate about it. So if so that we, even answers your question. <laughs> I, I think so. And it makes me think about like different worship leaders that I've talked to. I would even say some ex worship leaders who maybe felt like they were manipulating people. So when you say that, I don't know a bunch of music, but I think about I want to say G major or some kind of chord that people talk about, like these, the cheat chords where like you start playing these chords and people's emotions start going fuzzy. That's what I start thinking about. So when I, when I imagine you thinking like, okay, well, this is what the song, this is what the song feels like to me lyrically. And then mm -hmm. matching that with the right chords that communicate mm -hmm. the same thing in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially it's, I mean, I guess everybody has their own kind of ideas about how this works, but I think there are mm. definitely some like chords and like melodies that obviously like they just make you want to cry or like make you feel really happy or like angry. So once you start to understand, I guess, how to get there, then it's like, ooh, well, how, like, what fun can I have with this? Like, how do mm -hmm. I, which it is, and I do say this all the time, like, songwriters are master manipulators because mm. literally you know i could be having a great day and then i listen to i don't know like um oh by coldplay and then i want to cry for the rest of the day like you know mm. it's just, they they did that on purpose <laughs> so mm -hmm. it is manipulative but i think that's like the magic of songwriting is that you could take somebody to a completely different headspace than they were in before. Mm. So for me, when I, do you have friends that have been like worship leaders? I mean, it feels like it's kind of switching, but I, the curiosity in me pokes towards that. Like I have a couple friends who are like in the production or in that side of like um, a worship spiritual experience where you're kind of, I don't want to say conducting, but you are creating the experience. Mm -hmm. Do you have any personal stories of when you're like, when you were feeling weird about it yourself or when you were feeling like it's, maybe you're feeling weird about so, how somebody else is doing it or are there principles weird about how people way. do it? Hmm? <laughs> I said weird in what way? Like, um, maybe, maybe this, 
feels more performative or maybe this isn't real what this person is doing like i know this person it doesn't seem like they're being genuine or authentic right now yeah i think i run into that often especially now that we're in like mega church era um and there's like a certain standard of like service production that people are like trying to uphold um I think you can always tell when it feels disingenuous and it's it's odd but I think what is important like my mom used to say this to me all the time like how you conduct yourself when you're by yourself like if I'm if I'm not worshiping by myself then once I get in front of people and I start to try and lead them in worship, it's not going to work. Like they're not going to feel, they're not going to receive what I'm trying to give to them or what I'm trying to bring them into if I haven't experienced it myself. So it is definitely like a strange thing, but I think the most important part is to make sure that your own like personal relationship with Christ, aside from, all of you know the lights and the hundreds of people or whatever that you sing in front of like what are you like when all of that is taken away because that's what is most important and what will be shown when you're in front of all of those people because people can tell even if people are not musical or whatever like they know what the feeling is they know what it's supposed to be like you know mm -hmm. so that makes me think of two questions one is what is worship to you? So this is choose your own, choose your own adventure land. First question, what actually is worship to you? And the second question is, um, so when we say that people know genuine and, and disingenuous, just, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there, there are people who fake it a long time. And so what about those circumstances to you? And, it, you know, it's not like we're going to solve that. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe my question more is like, have you experienced that in, in people? Or how, how do you navigate that as somebody who is passionate about worship, watching somebody who you know is, is portraying something incongruent with who they are, or is... Mm -hmm kind of struggling somehow. I don't even want to, I don't like saying that, that we're struggling because I just don't, you know, there's just wounding, there's, we're all wounded and we're all healing and we're all journeying. Right. I think disingenuous or that incongruent is maybe more like it. Yeah. Um, well, then I'll start with that one first because we're already okay. there. I personally have a very hard time um, finding a church that I like in general, just because, like I said, my dad is a pastor. So I've grown up in the church all my life. I went to Christian high school, went to Christian college. So I've seen, I've seen it all. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it is difficult for me to see somebody who like is leading and is in front of people and it does not like go, like it doesn't make sense. Like, that's difficult for me to be around. And if I see that, like, I probably won't go back just because like, I don't, I've seen so much like fake stuff in my time in church or whatever. And I know that that's just not it. Like when you find people that are very, very genuine and they're showing the love of Christ. Like that's the kind of people I wanna be around. If you're not giving that off, then I'm probably just not gonna surround myself with that because it's weird. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and worship to me. Wait, 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 before we get to oh. worship, I want the follow-up question mm -hmm. about what does it tell for you? So if you're, let's say you walk into a whole new space I don't know if you mm -hmm. could even do this in a whole new space, but you, you're you someone who's in tune with the craft of music, in tune with the craft mm -hmm. of worship leading. That's a, that's a unique mm -hmm. skill set of music. And I would mm -hmm. say you are a unique, there's a giftedness, a, a divine sparkedness in your ability to 
lead. I think it comes partly from like black church culture, the ability to improvise, to live in a moment where you feel the passion to yeah, live in sure. there. So, but for you, when you walk in that space, what is the tell when you're like, oh, this, like, how do you start to feel it? And what are you experiencing when you see it? And you're like, huh, burn? I think one of, one of the things that, I don't even know how to really explain it, but you can just tell like when a worship leader is like so into themselves and not necessarily into like bringing the people into a worshipful like moment. Um, one thing for me that I like literally cannot stand is like people riffing and running all over the place. Now, let me tell you, I love a good old singer, you know. I love people that can really, really sing. I really love it. But sometimes it's not like we don't need all of that. We just need to be like led into a space. Like some people don't, some people in the congregation don't know how to worship or like what is comfortable for them for their own like personal worship style. So if you're not like, encouraging the people to come alongside you and worshiping the Lord, then it's, you've left some people out. And that's not the point. If you're like, so into like, oh, what am I doing? How do I sound? You know, how does a band sound? Like, those are all important things, but that's what rehearsal is for. So you like, think about all those things in rehearsals by the time you get to Sunday morning or whenever it is like you've fully prepared yourself enough to where all of that does not have to be in the forefront of your brain and you just worry about making sure the people are led and making sure that God is praised and that you're like the least important thing that's happening at the time so mm -hmm. yeah so something about what you said in in that line of um it, it, it made me start to think about a mutual friend of ours. Um, and I, Marque, it made me think of Marque. Oh, I, yeah. I went, I watched him, I watched him perform with his uh, younger band back at the House of Blues in LA a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a beautiful, heavenly experience. It had nothing to do with God. Well, I would say it had nothing to do with the gospel and everything right. had to do with the divinity of music and the spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that made me think about the craftsmanship back to like given to craft and then also like people who are gifted and skilled. Mm -hmm. And so, and a lot of people, I think they are gifted or they're maybe even in a space. LA is not a, LA is a very competitive space. I would say for a worship leader or a musician or anything in general, but especially in the entertainment yeah. industry can I know and we haven't even got to worship yet, but on that note, can you speak to what it means to like the craftswomanship of rehearsal, of putting in the work to own this three minute song that mm -hmm. took you, I mean, depending on how much years and reps you have with the song and with music in general, to really mm -hmm. own that three minutes in a way where you do fade into the background because you've done the work to fade back. Like, talk to me about yeah. that type of musician. Like, is that common? I think it's, I think a lot of people probably think that way. And it, it differs in like the secular realm and the worship realm, I feel like, because when you are performing, like when I perform my own stuff, it is solely about me. <laughs> like, that's the point you know, which freaks me out still to this day, but that, you know, I can do stuff where it's like, essentially like, look at me and what I'm doing and the skills that I have. Nasty, so, by the way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the head shake. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you get to leading worship, so like, okay, at APU, I led one of the bands for three years with another guy. Oh, with Brody. And um, 
we would be in rehearsal we'd go through every song we'd like iron out whatever kind of little moments and then we would just like jam because after like all these like regimented moments you kind of like forget that you're good <laughs> So you're like, okay, let me get this out really quick <laughs> because mm. just so I, by the time we get there, like, it's not like I feel the need to like rip on guitar or like whatever, you know, first of all, I can't rip on guitar. So there's that, but like, if I could, <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, that would, it's not the time to do that in service because it's not about you. Mm. That's like the whole Thing. it's not about you like obviously you're there to push like a certain moment but you're just aiding in the moment it's not like I am the moment it's mm. just I'm here just same as everybody else I just have like a little insight into what where we're supposed to be going mm -hmm. but we're all in the same level here it's no mm -hmm. you know i i like i really appreciate what you said when you started to share about those jam sessions it just made me think about um the w where our worth comes from or sometimes if we are not in the healthiest place then like we are like because we don't feel affirmed in our own skin or in our own story for whatever reason and i would just say that like i think we flow in and out of that healthy place things happen oh, yeah. COVID happens you lose a job you lose a loved one a relationship ends and then you you know you may have been really healthy and therapy has been great and then like you find yourself in the space where you're like I don't you know and then it's like and then we use whatever we can to get whatever we need and then you know yeah. if that's a worship leader then it's like my gift for music and this opportunity in front of these eyes even now like in the, these digital eyes watch the chat is the chat going nuts because I recorded it on Tuesday and I'm just here and I'm literally here watching myself do this thing just so I could read the chat but I, I only right. mention all that to say that it's interesting because I think any human would use any gift that they had in order to make to, to meet an unhealthy need or to just try to garner i'm thinking of like just clawing for health and we're all trying to yeah. do that so i think about yeah. that and then i also think about like jesus like if jesus walked away walked around that way on the planet mm -hmm. like who knows if we'd even have a planet he'd be like atomic just like right i want a chick-fil-a sandwich he'd be like what's oh. chick-fil-a right <laughs> So, but I, so yeah, I, I, those two things came to mind when I think about like health. And I guess that's just a reminder. I think the most important reminder is like, to me, it feels like it's okay not to be okay. And I think for me, this, this goes back to a conversation we recorded a couple of weeks ago with uh, Britt Barron. Um, and, but I think about, um, Sometimes I think that that piece, like for me, what I think is important to say is like, when I see somebody clawing for that affirmation or whatever it is that they need, mm -hmm. that's not a time for me to be like, ugh, ugh what are you doing? Like, what are you, it's, right. it's just a time to empathize and remember that like, oh man, I do that too. Yeah, I everybody do it does too. do that. I mean, let me tell you, I'll be the first to say I have fallen into that many times. It's so easy when you are, are in front of people all, all the time. It's easy to feel like, oh, like it's me. I did that. Like this is cute because I'm cute and I did it. So it's easy to fall into that. Or even um, like I, I think it really um, – makes you question what you what makes you think you're worthy like you know for I graduated in 2019 um and I had like a week and a half to sleep and recover from the last four years of college and then after that I like took off and started doing stuff like immediately was working and I was like oh my god this is so fun like I'm living my dreams right now I'm being paid to sing like what? you know and then I had maybe like a year 
a year and some change in, and then we have COVID. And so I can't do that anymore. I don't have the gigs that I used to have. I don't have the sessions. I don't have like shows to go and see my friends do the same thing that I'm doing. I was like, hey, well, I'm depressed and I need something. <laughs> like, what is it? Um, and then when you bring in like social media into that equation, it gets even worse. And then you're like, I had to tell myself like, don't post just because you want somebody to tell you that you're good. You already know that you're good. You don't have some, you don't need to have somebody else tell you that. If you're gonna post, do it because you like what you just made, not because you want other people to like it so bad and they'll tell you that they like it. Like, no, none of that. But it's very easy to fall into that and wanting validation, everybody goes through that. Even if they say they don't, they do. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell me about, we are, we are literally miles away from your definition of worship. We will get back there, <laughs> but I think- We're not that far, we're not that far. Come on, I, I feel like, um, what, when you talk about like, you don't need that people that you know you're good. I love that you said that. And I think there, there's a lot of people that our life stories have not told us that. Mm -hmm. We've been living through a different story that said like, we are not good. And so we're mm -hmm. at work, we're trying to like, we're working like way over time, trying to improve a boss that will never, you know, try to uh, uh, impress a boss that will never like, will never even mm -hmm. validate you because she is so wounded because they are so wounded. It's just like not good, but I, so we're all again back to that place of like, we are we are we all need to be reminded of that goodness. To me, that's that's what the gospel. It just literal stake in the ground. You mean everything right. to me, right? But you said I know I'm good. Can you share with us what are the the practices you have in your life that remind you that you're good? You sp you specifically talked about musically and like in your gift in your craft. I would say like in general, that included. Well, it's, first of all, it's an ongoing process because I'm like queen of self-deprecating comments. <laughs> um, but I had a friend tell me like, what, like, what are you doing this for? What does this, what does this do for you? And I'm like, I don't know. It just feels right. He's like, okay, but like all you're doing is making you feel worse about yourself. And I'm like, oh. That should have been obvious to me, but it wasn't. Um, so in the moments where I feel like trash, I literally just go back in my mind or like even in like conversations that I've had with people and seeing like the difference in like where I am at currently and like where I was before. And I'm like, that person is good and I'm still that person. I'm just having like a weird moment. So it's ch like chill. When you think, I think I've started, started to think more big picture than like right in the now, which is very much how I have been forever. Um, I always forget how young I am. I think I'm like 36, but I'm 23. So I have to tell myself like, relax. You have so much life to live. Like in the grand scheme of things, a few horrible days out of your year is not going to ruin you completely. In fact, it might make you a little bit better because when you get out of it, you're like, oh, so this is what I did to get out of it. Taking mental notes to know that the next time that I'm in a funk or whatever, like, let me remind myself that it's not gonna last forever. And that again, that person that people have seen that they think is a good person. I am still that person. I'm just having a weird time. I really, I really appreciate that. I think what I heard you say is that taking a long view and that's something that I always, I, whenever I'm kind of sharing with somebody or somebody sharing something deep with me, it's easy for the other person to be like, yo, I'm gonna be honest, a year from now, this won't matter. Or three mm -hmm. years from now, I know this is a big deal right now. So I think right. that, that taking the long view and then I think what you said also just reminding yourself of some of the the 
the accomplishments or some of the ways that you have proven yourself or, or reminding yourself of who you are? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's easy to lose sight of who you are, especially in today's like day and age where, I mean, I do work a lot in Instagram land because I have gotten like really good gigs from that. So I can't stop. However, it's just like, there's a line that you have to draw like if you start to have a very convoluted like image of yourself because of all of what you're seeing in media like you got to take a step back and like remember like oh I am whatever good qualities you want to say about yourself because it's easy to feel less than when you compare yourself to other people's stuff so mm. the, com- the, the comparison game is 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 tough 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 we yeah for there's a we had we had another conversation a couple of weeks back uh with david lee and he talked about the chinese proverb of there's always a bigger mountain which is like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how much you it doesn't matter the gig like you did the oscars and it's like there are bigger gigs. There's always going to be a bigger gig. There's always going to right. be a bigger artist. And even when you're at the top of the mountain, there's anxiety and challenge that comes with that. And you're looking at everybody around you who's coming for your spot or whatever. Right. Um, but, and I think for me, one of the things that I get away from, but I used to say a lot was like, you're just comparing in the wrong direction. Because if you were thinking <laughs> about 18 year old Aston or, or the people who aren't where you are even, then you become more grateful and appreciative of where you are. We yeah. shouldn't, we shouldn't need that. We shouldn't need to look around at people who have less than us to be grateful for what right. we have. But if we're going to be comparing, uh, that's a more helpful compare comparing direction, mm-hmm. which I would say we, we just don't need to be comparing. We need to like settle into our story, just kind of yeah. sit where we are, be where we are and do mm-hmm. the work that, that those moments invite us to do. So yeah. that's totally. interesting. So when we think about worship, when you, when you, when you say that word worship and worship leading, like, what is, what do those words mean to you? Um, I think worship is giving whatever gift God has given you back to him in whatever way that means for you. Now, I do happen to like actually lead worship at churches, but I feel like, and I say this all the time, like I write, I don't, my first instinct is not to write like Christian songs. It just isn't. So I write a lot of like, I don't even know what to call them, like folk soul type, whatever is always pretty sappy or whatever. Um, I still think that's worship because my heart is in in the place where I'm like, okay, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do in whatever space that means. So when I go out to these gigs or whatever, I'm not like, hi, everyone. My name's Aston and I'm a Christian. How are you doing? Like, that's weird. But <laughs> I am like, you know, I try my best to be kind to people, whatever. And then I hope that that shows up in my music and that people want to talk to me about why I feel the way that I feel or whatever. And then I get to express to them like, because I've been shown immense love, like that's what pours out of me. That's why my songs are so sappy (laughs) because I feel a lot of love inside that I've been shown from the Lord and from others. I experience God a lot in the words of other people and um, sharing experiences with other people. So the love that I have been shown from others is pouring out of me. And I hope that people ask me why. So that's like, when I think worship, I don't think like, oh, I have to lift my hand. I mean, you can do that. That's great. I do that too. But it's not a one sided, like one directional thing. There's many things that worship can be as long as you are giving whatever gifts you have back to God. I think that's the whole point. As long as it's all like directed towards him. That's what I think worship is. 
Mm. I appreciate that. I think um, I I just appreciate a posture of um, gratitude. I think that there's like a when I think about Paul and some of the things that he wrote, there's this um, this posture of gratitude of being transformed. And then there's like a, this is how we respond with gratitude. Um, and so Paul would write about that. And how do we just be just because God is so gratuitously loving and gracious, that doesn't mean that we abuse that or, or take it for granted, or we're not appreciative or grateful or aware of that. And that awareness to me becomes like an important thing. And I, to be honest, for me, one of the things that I paid the big bucks for at seminary, like the one thing I walked away, one of a couple of things that were very important to me at that moment, I learned a lot of things. Um, mm-hmm. But to me, my understanding of worship and the definition of worship that I walked away with, which it, it doesn't have to be yours, but I think uh, in this conversation, it was, you know, any practice that orients me to who God is. Mm-hmm. And so it is being in awe of a sunrise it is being in awe of my children it is Mm -hmm. it can be musical it can be cars if you're if you work with your hands it can be uh wood woodworking it can be you know writing it can be barista it can be and it can be communicating with other people or honoring the dignity the image of god and another human being but any practice that like reorients me to the character and nature of God. There's a, 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 a leader a, a few, I don't even know what to call this guy. Um, I think he's a, he's a, a friar, a father, but Richard Rohr. Um, mm-hmm. And he talks about, he calls prayer. He says, prayer is anything that um, draws us towards more faith, hope, and love. And I guess I would kind of blend that and say that for me and that the worship, it is practices that orient me to who God is, the nature of God. And to me, then I would borrow from Richard Rohr and say, those practices that orient me towards faith and hope and love. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I really appreciate that. I really, really appreciate that. Well, let's get into some scripture then, Dean, and we'll see what you think about this. We are going to go to Deuteronomy. Genesis, yes. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse three. This is the, oh no, not verse three. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Verse four. (laughs) All right. uh, Deuteronomy six, verse four. Uh, This becomes like this mantra that guides the Hebrew people as they go through um, exile after exile. Um, it's written in exile. It carries them through. This is how we behave. This is what it means. Um, and so I think with those blended, what does it mean to, with your definition of worship being the gifts that are in our hearts and our hands and our minds to give, that we mm-hmm. give those back to God. Um, and I would then take that further and say, we give those back to people on behalf of God, that we love people with our music we love people with our whatever those things are whatever the gift is food cooking mm-hmm. whatever um and we practice those things and they reorient us and we remember oh i didn't i didn't generate this like even if i wanted to like a lot of people could have studied music at apu and they wouldn't be as good as you because they weren't born to do it um and they didn't have the same story so um deuteronomy 6 is, is part of that so let me read it here it's deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 6 the writer says, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And we shall love the Lord, our God, with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I'll say it again in the kind of like you commanding kind of voice says hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might so that that posture of love Ashton what comes to your mind when you think of that that scripture in the context of 
what you've shared about your story and worship and leading and the technicalities and the rehearsals? Um, just the fact that the word that is repeated most in that passage is all saying all your, all your, all your, all your. So it means everything that I have, I'm supposed to love God with. I cannot, if God has given me this gift, right? I'm not showing him love by not doing anything with it. So that means I need to practice. Even though like we were saying, there's a difference between like leading and performing, right? You practice to perform essentially. And then when you get to lead, then you start to, you know, you, you leave all that behind because you prepared. So it's my worship our worship is just giving our all whatever that is to God so even if your all is not that much you know you giving it is an act of worship because that means you love God enough to give even when you feel like you don't have anything left or if you feel like you have a lot when when we have a lot I feel like we tend to want to keep it to ourselves but we should be doing the opposite. If we have a lot, we still have to give all because that's what was commanded of us, even though it's hard, really hard. But that's that's what it is. That's what we got to do. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you say that, it makes me think about the ways that we give ourselves to our giftedness. And for mm-hmm. you, right, you had that moment that you talked about where it's like, oh, this is this is what I want to give myself to. And it's scary. And I'm not sure. I don't know if I'll be able to make a living doing this. But you took that risk. And then you saw some success in it. And then and then the pandemic happened. And then there was no more of that in in that way. So when I think about that, giving your all I think about what does it mean to be all in? um, Mm -hmm. In those things. Mm. I think about you know, with all your heart, your soul, and with all your might. And that feels like, I don't know, I want to say like an indictment. You know, whenever I think about who God is, um, and when again, back to like, whenever I'm having a conversation with somebody, and they may feel shameful about something that they've done, or, and I always think about like, hey, I want to remind you, God knows every single detail of your life, that led you to like react to this moment in that way that you don't like about yourself right now. Yeah. God knows every single why he knows the moments when you're, when your parents deprived you, he knows the moment when that person said that thing in middle school, he knows every moment in high school where people said this, that, or the other about you. Mm -hmm. Um, God knows all of that. So I think about like the soul and the heart and I don't know, that just makes me, think about that um like god knows our capacity god knows what all is right now right pandemic yeah. all pandemic all let me tell you come on pandemic all like i said i went from having something like at least three times a week to now most of the things i do are First off, I should say I'm very thankful to have had any kind of work during this time being a mm. musician. Because I know a lot of people that that is not their story. And I've pretty much worked throughout this quarantine just in like a different setting and not in the way that I want because I want to be around people playing music and stuff. And obviously I can't do that right now, but it's been rough and still having to like lead worship and from a space of like very I mean honestly I had to like take us like a second to mourn <laughs> all of what was supposed to be 2020 because 2020 was going to be really good for me I had a lot of things lined up and then I couldn't do it um but having to lead worship out of that kind of weird headspace and heart space was very strange but I was like okay if I can't do anything else right now I'm just gonna have to sing to the Lord because 
thank you for providing for me throughout this entire time. Cause I, I moved like a month before we got shut down and I was like, okay, sick. My rent is doubling and I'm moving. So I got to get a bunch of new stuff. And now hmm. we don't, we can't work. <laughs> Mm, mm, mm. no <laughs> no but I mean I'm still here and I've you know the Lord has provided through and through so I'm like I don't have much to give like emotionally currently mm. but what I do have I will gladly give to God because what like what what else is there and what do I have to lose like <laughs> If I don't, if I don't do that, then I've lost like my faith and my hope, essentially. If I'm not able to sing in the midst of craziness. So, I mean, that might be different for somebody else. Like you were naming off a bunch of different things earlier, like writing or work, like whatever you do with your hands or whatever. Like if you can't, you know, give that back to God right now, when we're all kind of like freaking out a little bit, like this is the time that it counts, I feel like. It's like easy to do it when everything is squeaky clean and all great. But when things start to rev up, it's like, okay, well, where does my strength actually come from? Like, where does my help actually come from for real? So. Mm. Yeah, I think about, you know, when you share that a couple of things, I feel like, there's like three just steam light rail trains in my brain but I, I i think about one is like it's almost you know it isn't worship isn't just like i owe you this you gave it to me so like i'm giving it to you it's also like if you love like for me like i love scripture i love to be in it i love to um i don't even know what narrate it but i also love like um just dissecting it and so for me it's a gift to be able to like read it in the midst of like pandemic or any time it's like it's mm -hmm. a gift just to be able to do the thing that I was created to do and so mm -hmm. and I think part of that like that I guess that that encouragement for sisters and brothers who uh, are listening is like it doesn't it doesn't have to be like for the the billions of dollars that you used to do it for pre pandemic, it doesn't have to be for like gazillion followers. That's why like, just this morning, I was at a this is today's Ash Wednesday. I was at an Ash Wednesday, um, little outdoor park situation took my daughters. And I read this um, devotional that was written by um, a sister at my church, Stephanie Jenkins, shout out at Stephanie Jenkins. And, <laughs> and I'm looking at the bottom, I'm like, wait, so she wrote this whole thing. She has a website and she has like a few hundred followers, but she's being faithful to that thing. And like, mm -hmm. when we just do our thing, sometimes like it doesn't feel the same, but it, it, it's almost, it is a hanging on to hope in the middle of like everything that's going on. It's yeah. a gift for us. So I guess I'm, I'm saying like, yes, we want to use it, but it isn't like God isn't up in heaven. Like, which is also another thing. Like, that, that God would be somewhere other than where we are. But like, there's not a deficit on God's end where God is like, Hey, uh, run me my worship. <laughs> it, it's a gift for us to be able to like, right. It is a gift. It's that opportunity to like get under the hood of the car and get into it. It's the opportunity mm -hmm. to sing into the mic onto a computer, which you didn't do before. You used to go to the spot, go to the rehearsal studio and, and get nuts. But mm -hmm. it's still a gift to be able to like exercise the things we were created to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so. So that was one of the, the steam trains. I will spare the other ones. But I think one that I do want to say is that our whole heart, it doesn't mean like I think about authenticity and we talked about genuineness mm -hmm. and it's one thing for somebody to step onto the stage or to try to lead in a way that back to, we talked about performative, but it's one thing to be like, okay, I'm supposed to look like this when I do this thing. So I'm going to do that. But I would, I think that, you know, this feels like a reminder also to like your whole heart lead that way. And if you're feeling like crap, be honest about that and lead that way. 
You oh, yeah. That always... is me today. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I mean, that's that's your whole heart. So we don't have to compartmentalize with God. Like, it's not like, oh, I can only be happy. I can only be joyful with God. It's yeah. Like, but I, I think, and that's an admonition that would like help a exiled people, people who have been discriminated against right. their, their whole existence that would remind them like, no, you, we bring our full selves to God. We don't bring like right. these different caricatures of who we think we're supposed to be right now. Yeah. Say, Yo, where are you? My enemies are around me. They're, where right. the heck are you at? Mm-hmm. Mashing I, my head. R- yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think there's something so powerful about Well, I mean, it's just unity. That's what it is. Like, I remember Mm. my junior year, um, I literally, that was probably one of the worst years of my life, right? I was a mess the entire year from like the beginning. Actually, it started in the summer when I was still interning with you. It was, uh, my life was going just nutty, right? Mm. And I remember there were a few times I like showed up to rehearsal for chapel and I'd like be trying to tell the team what I wanted us to do and I just literally have to like sit down for a minute because I'm like I am I right now (laughs) cannot do this like I am drained I am sad I am tired I am angry I'm like all these things and people on my team were like honestly me too like can we sit and talk about it or like when I would do chapel I'm not a very like outwardly emotional person when it comes to like negative emotions, which what even are those? But (laughs) I remember having to like turn around on stage because I was like, this is so much like, I'm literally just, I'm out of it. And I would tell them to like, I am hurting currently, but I want to like give it. I don't want to have it anymore. And the amount of people that would like come up to me and be like, I'm in like a very similar space. Like, thank you so much for being vulnerable. Like there's such a, I don't, I don't want to say stigma, but there's like a preconceived notion that anybody who's like on a platform is like perfect and they themselves feel like they need to portray perfection but all that does is drive a wedge between the stage and the congregation where you don't want, you don't want that at all. You want it to just feel like everybody's in the same room. So it gives such a sense of unity when you are real with the people around you, they know that you're real. They feel like they can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all literally, it's all about leading by Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to be real in order for people to experience real things. I love that. Like I'm thinking about like (laughs) just the tweetable thing is like, hey, Aston dropped some serious knowledge on us. You got to be real for real things to happen. It's true. (laughs) I know it's so real, but it's like we're so stuck on Instagram that we have to be reminded that like in order to experience real things, you have to be real. Remember you have to be real. Come on. People love real. That's why like the funniest stuff that we see on like Instagram and Twitter is all like very, very <laughs> real content. You're just like, this kind of hurts because this is me, but it's funny because it's real. Yes. I see about all the like parenting fails that happen. It's that's, great. This is like, oh, and you're like, it's that sense of unity. Like you say, it's like, you're not alone. Yeah. And that's to me, when you said that leadership and leading, that's what leading is. Like it's, it's setting the tone to me. I always think of leadership as like the person who's willing to go first. Right. So mm-hmm. A lot of times if there's like a small group setting or something and like a leader is leading it, I'm always like when a leader sets that space up and then tells somebody else to go first, then the other person is actually setting the tone for the conversation. Unless, Mm -hmm. the you know, sometimes as a leader, you can like create, you know, expectations or whatever. I'm only saying that to say like, yes, that's what it means to lead on the stage towards genuine 
reality or to be um, authentic and vulnerable. Like we want yeah. those things desperately. All of us want to be like, does God actually love people who miss the mark? Does God actually love people who right. don't trust or don't believe yet or still have all these doubts? But a lot of times spiritual leadership is portraying something different than even what they're trying to say, like God loves you unconditionally. And every system we set up has hella conditions. So make mm -hmm. sense of that one. Um, yes, you can. <laughs> right. Yes, you can be honest with God, but I will never say anything that like incriminates me on this stage. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's tough. So I, I just really appreciate that reminder from you about like, yeah, leadership means leading. And then it's like, it goes back to the first part of our conversation where it's like, how long can you fake? And then like, what, what when the leader leads us down this road, but it hasn't been genuine, or it's kind of like, it's kind of intertwined with just like unhealth or things like that. It's tough. Yeah, it is tough. And when like, I always think about I've never ever in my entire life like wanted to be in ministry simply because <laughs> like the Bible says, right, you get judged doubly for the people that you are like accountable for. So if I'm going to be in any kind of ministry and I'm leading people in like a fake like way that that is reflective on me later on. I don't want to be that way. I'd rather be very honest and like upfront about where I am. And if pe like, I'd rather do that and like lose a job or whatever, like lose a leadership position than keep up a facade because it's hurting me and it's hurting everybody else around me, even if I don't really know it. Being honest and genuine, I think it's just the way to go even like for um like in the music world or whatever like there's so many people doing the same thing that you are doing so if you are not genuine and authentic to yourself like nobody's gonna care because there's not a shortage of people doing the same thing that I'm doing there are many people doing the same thing that I'm doing if I'm trying to be like her the artist literally her nobody's gonna right 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 nobody's gonna want to hear what i have to say if i'm trying to model myself after her because there's already one who's mm. doing it so i might as well just be authentic from the beginning because there's only one aston and there's mm. only one mark Bloop. yeah aston are you freaking kidding me man come on so much lovely beauty reminders of authenticity. I mean, we just talked about your story and the invitation to um, how you discovered or woke up to really like you're like, oh, I'm doing this thing that like, oh, this is what it really is. That moment of like, oh, that's what this really is. I'm really afraid to give myself fully to this because I'm afraid that this is not a secure decision. And mm -hmm. to get into the heart of that and then to be courageous and to pursue, oh, this is what I really love. And then for it to open up as you make yeah. those courageous steps. I really appreciate yeah. that. And then talking about worship and authenticity and vulnerability from the stage. And, uh, and then we talked about Deuteronomy uh, and this kind of reminder that God in the very beginning and this setting the tone of what it means to follow God, this thing that all the Jews would repeat to their children and all the time is to worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Um, I think it's just a, an incredible reminder. So ladies and gentlemen, Ashton, thank you so, so, so much for being here. You can follow Ashton on Instagram, actually follow her first on Spotify, get the streams. We're talking about, no, I'm kidding. But <laughs> follow Ashton on Spotify. You can find her on Instagram at, at A S T Y N T U R R. Um, and you, there's some really she talked about runs being a distraction there they might be a distraction in worship but when you see the stuff she's creating on there <laughs> there ain't no distraction ask yeah. justin timberlake ask justin timberlake burn 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 it's the face <laughs> ask justin timberlake so remember we celebrate uh aston's story one day we'll celebrate justin's story let me not go there right now but uh <laughs> we celebrate aston's story <laughs> 
to rem- to remind you that your story is worth celebrating too. And if we all sat down together, we can learn incredible things together. And we reimagine Deuteronomy 6 uh, and kind of came to that place of like, God isn't expecting us to compartmentalize or to hide or to perform, but just to bring our whole heart, our whole selves to those moments and to, to be oriented towards faith, hope, and love and to give what we have to, to God and to our neighbors and people around us, uh, especially in a time like now. So thanks, Ashton. We appreciate you. Just remember you are loved and we are family and that's just the way it is. Peace, y'all. We are-